What's up, Deuce? Good morning. Hey, so, um, you had 10 days uh, when Doug was out, uh, when he was home uh, in quarantine to kind of um, handle the on the field stuff. Uh, what did you get out of that experience? What was your approach to it? And uh, uh, how did it go for you? First of all, it was awesome just being able to uh, be in that role, to be able the organization look at me and trust me to be in that role to lead the team. So that was the awesome part of it. And I, I just took it one day at a time, continuing to deliver Doug's message, um, continue to meet with the team, continue to talk with Doug virtually um, to deliver his message. Um, I took a lot from it. I, I tell you, you know, it was exciting for me because, of course, playing here and um, in this great city and coming back coaching and being able to be the head coach for, for those 10 days was just awesome. Can't say enough about it. Go ahead, Kristen, and then Nick Fierro. Good morning, Deuce. Um, when we've talked to some of the running backs, and we've talked about Miles Sanders, they've said that his how he approaches the field and how he looks at the field has changed and developed since year one. I'm curious what you've seen from him and his mental approach to, to the game and how he sees the field here in year two. Yeah, I think you nailed it with the mental part. Uh, his mental focus right now is unbelievable. Just being able to understand the concepts and what we're trying to do as an offense um, with him and other players um, and with his skill level, being able to match him up on safeties and linebackers. Um, it's just Miles understanding the game a little bit better, being able to know what to study and what to look for. And now he's going out there and he's playing faster in year two. So that's what I see on the field from Miles. Nick and then Dave Zingaro. Hi, Deuce. Um, I had asked uh, Doug about this the other day. Um, you know, without uh, the preseason games and only just a couple of days where you really have the uh, tackling to the ground, uh, how tough does that make it for, uh, you know, especially like the rookie running backs to, to evaluate in terms of ball security? He was saying that uh, with the work that you were doing with them, he's not really too concerned. But uh, how, how much difficult, uh, how much more difficult does it make uh, to get these guys ready to go? Yeah, you, I mean, it's still my job uh, to make sure that we focus on ball security and make sure they understand how important it is, of course. Um, and we do those drills. So we do three or four ball security drills every day. We talk about it every day. And uh, we show how certain defenses attack each day um, in our room. So uh, it's something that definitely is talked about, something we share as far as with, with our players. We talk about it. With a film, we go out there, we walk through, uh, we punch at the ball with some of our drills. So every day we're talking ball security. And, um, you know, it's you can't go a day without it. Dave and then Zach Berman. Hey, Deuce, we've seen uh, Darren Sproles out in the field a little bit. I know he's not technically a coach, but how much has he been able to work with the running backs? And how much does that <clears> help you to uh, an older guy who's been in the league a long time help out those young kids? Well, he is coaching, so <laughs> he is doing that, and I, I joke with him all the time. It's definitely a big help when the younger guys see him in the room. Um, of course, you know, Corey and and Miles and, and Boston, you know, they were able to, to, to suit up with them and go to war with them. But now seeing him on the other side, being able to come back and coach him says a couple of things. It says, one, that he cares about them. He cares about their development. Also, uh, him being out there, taking the time away from his family shows how dedicated he, um, he is into helping them. Um, and don't just look at the running backs. Also, look at Rager. All right, so he's helping the punt returners also. Um, some, of, you know, some of the things when it comes to no matter if it's a high ball, a long ball, uh, short balls, stuff like that, uh, how to read the punters walk down, uh, just stuff like that, valuable information, man, valuable information that comes from a vet like him. So uh, they're embracing it, they love it, and they're enjoying it. Go ahead, Zach, and then Jeff McLean. Hey, Deuce, what are the offensive meetings like without a, 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 a designated offensive coordinator? Who runs those meetings, and how are they different than your previous uh, seven years in the league? No different. Uh, it goes back to, uh, I guess I did an interview earlier this year when we talked about we all take that role. So in that meetings, we all have a voice. We're all talking. Doug is in that meeting also. 
So we share our ideas. We come up with the game plan. We put it on paper. We go out on the field and we execute it. Jeff and then Chris Franklin. Deuce, uh, obviously Miles Sanders can, can do short yardage plays, but you know, is it is it necessary to maybe bring in a veteran who can who can do that so that it, it takes a little bit of the load off Miles and he, he isn't getting banged up as much, or is this just a vote of confidence that he's going to be pretty much the three down lead back of this team? I think we have good backs. Um, I think that Miles can do it all, and when you have a guy like Miles that can make people miss, that can lower his shoulder and also run you over. You want to put the ball in his hands as much as possible, and you trust him. So I think that's where we are. Uh, we have Corey, we have Boston, we have a, a cast of younger guys also, and we'll see what they can do here shortly. But as much as I can give the balls to Miles and let him create and, and go out there and you know just kind of just trust him to, to do the right thing, I think you do it as much as possible. Chris and then Bo. Morning, Deuce. Uh, yeah. How have the rookies been so far uh, when it comes to the passing game, and what areas would you like to see some improvement in when it comes to that? Strictly running backs or just the rookies in general? Strictly running backs. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Strictly running backs. Oh, they've been good. Um, you know, coming out of college, the language is a little bit different. Um, so you, you get on this level, especially being in the West Coast, uh, some of the plays are as long as train smoke, but <laughs> these guys are, are getting it. And um, we're getting better as coaches because we're trying to shorten it down a little bit because um, a lot of these players come from one word calls, which means everything. So when they're in the huddle longer than five or six seconds, you know, they get to shake in a little jittery because by that time, either they're on the line of scrimmage or there's no huddle. So we got to tell them to stay in the huddle, make sure they get the play call. Uh, and understand the play call. And with the West Coast offense, the West Coast offense speaks to everybody when it comes to the passing game. So that's why the plays are long. So once again, once they figure out the call, now they got to break the huddle and get lined up and go run the play. So uh, it's been a transition. Usually a lot of those things come with OTAs. You're able to get out there doing OTAs. Um, you're able to be redundant with some of the calls. You're able to teach them. Uh, you know, the concept, uh, not just the route that they're running, but the concept just in case we plug them in somewhere else. Somewhere else. So uh, it's been challenging, but I think those guys are doing an awesome job. Bo and then EJ. Hey, Deuce, um, if I could circle back to, uh, you know, your the time you spent as the, as the head coach in the building for those 10 days, you know, I'm sure that, that, you know, becoming a head coach is something that you've thought about. So, you know, what did you learn from that experience? And uh, is there anything that, you learned that, like, when you think about having the opportunity, you would you it, it affected how you would do things. I learned the three L's, and the three L's are listen, learn, and lead. So that that's what I got from that uh, awesome experience, um, and just being able to to step in. And one of one of the things we talk about as coaches, and you guys have seen it as players, of course, over the last couple of years, when one of our star players go down. It's the next man up mentality as players. Well, Doug will tell you, it's the next man up mentality this year dealing with the pandemic as coaches also. So when Doug was out of the building, he trusted me to step right in and take over and to continue to deliver our message as a team and continue to deliver his message. It was awesome, man. Um, I I've learned a lot. And uh, I got a little notebook up there with some, some secrets in it. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's been cool. Go ahead, EJ, and then John McMullen. Hey, Deuce. We've talked about how Miles has an impact in the passing game. Um, how does that affect the way that defenses can play you guys, whether he's lined up in the backfield or the slot? Yeah, it, it means a lot. Um, being able – and you saw last year, you saw Miles get better, get better and better in the passing game, um, from protection to running routes and catching the ball. So uh, – and those are the three main things when it comes to – being a elite third down back. Protection is number one, route running is number two, and then of course we all know you have to catch the ball. And I saw Miles just continuing to climb the mountain and continuing to get better uh, in all in all three phases. And when you when you're back there, 
and you have a linebacker and you're trying to take advantage of a linebacker and, and you're out there and you got Ertz who's in the slide and you got Alshon, you got DJ, and then you got Miles. I mean, it's the perfect matchup for him to be able to go out there and take advantage of a linebacker who thinks he can cover him. And I tell him all the time, you know, just don't sell those guys short. Continue to be disciplined, continue to learn all you can learn because you have the skill set to go out there and be a good route runner. So that's one of the things he's been practicing on this offseason. That's a couple things that we've been we've been talking about, trying to get him better. Um, and I'm just excited where he is. We got time for a couple more, so we'll, we'll go John and then Les. Uh, good morning, Deuce. Uh, in the past, Doug has talked about you leading the developmental program and gave you a lot of credit, not only for guys like Boston, but Greg Ward, Josh Perkins, all, all the practice squad guys. How, how much different is that this year in a truncated offseason to really uh, work those guys, the younger players who don't get a lot of reps? How, how much different is that for you this time? Yeah, this whole year is going to be different. This whole year is going to be full of adjustments. And that's what we have to do as a coaching staff. And that's what we've been doing. And Doug has been an awesome job. He put together – he's been doing an awesome job. He put together a great plan, um, which we all know that can be adjusted at any day. So when you look at the developmental program and some of those younger guys, the thought process hasn't changed. We want to develop these guys. We want to help these guys understand the NFL – um, we want to make sure they compete daily, um, and we just want to continue to show them how to study film. So it's a couple things that's involved. Uh, we'll see how it goes once we break camp because, of course, now, um, like I said, we're doing a little adjusting, but uh, the thought process is to still go through with that. Okay, last one, less, and then we'll get Mark on in here. Hey, Deuce. What's up, Mark? Holly Field came in last, at the end of last year. Didn't really get a chance to talk to you about him. Uh, interesting guy. He was very, very productive in college. It looked like when the early part of the draft process that he was going to be maybe a, a high round pick. Then he ran horribly slow and dra- kind of dropped off the table. Uh, how do you see him? What, what do you make of his, uh, his whole journey to this point? Well, I took my hat off to him because once he came in, he basically learned 80 to 85 percent of our offense in that short period of time. So the kid is a smart kid and he works hard. And you're able to see that with some of the workouts that he was doing away from the building and also some of the workouts that he's been doing now with Ted. And you see it on the field. Uh, He's a you know, he's a, a hundred miles per hour every play. He's going to get in there. He's a physical specimen. He's going to get in there. He's going to knock you around uh, with protection. Special teams, he's going to run down, and, and uh, he's, he's going to knock you around a little bit. Uh, I, I, I like where he is. He's hungry. He's out to prove uh, to everybody, uh, all the doubters at least, he's out to prove to them that he can play. And one of the things we, we've seen um, from many players, and those of you that study this game for a very long time, uh, you got guys that run slow with the 40, but then you got guys that play fast. So you, you got to look a little deeper. Does he play fast or does he play like the 40 he ran? So that's how I, I started to study these players, and I've been doing that for a while, and that's how I see some of these players. And how do you see him? I think he plays fast. I think he plays faster than what his 40 represents. Um, and, hey, that 40 is a, is a, is a nerve-wracking deal, man. You know, you're getting up there and you got to do everything right. And, you know, sometimes you don't run the time that you want to run initially. Then you go back and run slower. So it's a lot of pressure that's involved versus getting out there and just telling them, pin his ears back and run. And you'll see a lot of guys like that even play faster. Well, look at Jerry Rice, for example. Okay. Prime example. Hey, Good morning. Mark, Mark, Mark. Good morning. Um, nice to meet you. Pleasure. Um, yeah, this, this is your first time really laying eyes, you know, on these uh, defensive backs. I mean, who is there anybody that kind of has stood out or maybe surprised you based on what you've seen live versus maybe what you've seen on, you know, the opponent's tape when you were with Atlanta? Well, you know, uh, all of them really because uh, their competitive edge has been one of the things that I've been excited about. You know, most of the time as a coach, when you come in, you normally have to – wait to see when that will happen. 
but the leadership and the competitive edge has been amazing from the guys that, that have already been here and the additions. Mike and then Daniel Gallon. Hey, Mark Juan, thanks for doing this. Um, you've had success with corners that there are all different sizes, big guys in Seattle, short guys in, in Atlanta. Avante Maddox is playing on the outside, and at five foot nine and 184 pounds, he's kind of smaller than your stereotypical corner these days. Is there an advantage to actually having that low center of gravity on the outside? Well, I say one of the things, and, and you guys know he's the ultimate competitor, and that's really the huge part. Uh, but he, it brings that advantage of him having also played inside because, you know, motions and things of that nature actually happen. So from that standpoint, he has the ability to be play, also play in and play outside. So I've always kind of, in my history, even though size and we, people talk about that a lot, I always looked at the cornerback position meaning that a guy that can play the slot, the guy that can possibly be outside, because we're technically one motion from being an in or out player. And I think he has gravitated towards that. Not only has he played a lot of football, but he's gravitated towards that challenge as well. Daniel and then Martin Frank. Hey, Mark Juan. Uh, this is our first time getting to talk to you. Uh, how did this opportunity come together, and what was the decision like to you know, join this coaching staff? Oh, man. Um, as you guys know, I, I had a year off. And, you know, it was just one of those things. I always say this in a positive light. It was a really good time to reevaluate, self-evaluate on things that I wanted to do moving forward. So when the opportunity came up, I had a couple interviews set up. And, you know, I just came in and I said that I wanted it to be a great opportunity. That, not that I, I can only grow but with an organization that has the same mindset as I do as well and love football. So that in January, it came up, prayed about it. And the next thing you know, I get a phone call and uh, Jim and Doug invited me to come in for an interview. And we're here now. So it was, it was a it was a blessing, man. Martin and then Jimmy. Hey, Mark Juan. Um, my question is about uh, Sidney Jones. I mean, you know, he's obviously, you know, the Eagles had a lot of high expectations for him. Um, the third year in the league, he's had injuries and everything like that. What what do you think, you, from looking at him, what you can get out of him and, and your impressions of what he's done so far? So far, um, when I first took the job, we had a good conversation. And me being in Seattle when he was in college, so I seen a lot of things that he was capable of doing. And, you know, in this league, as you guys already know, it's a lot of scouting that goes about. However, I told him the three things that I really needed him to do, and we had that dialogue on how he needed to do it, when he needed to do it, and how consistent he needs to be at it. So I just think from that standpoint, the, the competitive edge and understanding how you play in this league, what you do in this league to be successful and the things of that nature, and now how confidence plays in everything else. Jimmy and then Paul Domowicz. Hey, Mark. And um, you have a lot of moving parts in the secondary, and that Slay is new. Roby Coleman's new. Maddox is heading into a season playing outside for the first time. Mills is going from corner to safety, and you yourself, you're new, obviously. The one starter is returning to the team at his regular position is Rodney. So have you sort of leaned on him more than you normally might to be something of a coach on the field for you? Well, I wouldn't say that, man. Uh, he takes that role on his own. If you guys know that, he didn't play the little brother to Jinx. He just wasn't as vocal uh, to everyone else. But he's always had that same uh, leadership. We go way back. Um, even when I first started coaching, we met at the East Shrine. I don't know how many people know that. And we had a good dialogue. And even at that time, I used to tell him, he was a corner. I was like, hey, man, you're going to play about 10 years at safety. And he was like, ah, he wanted to fight me about it. But it was one of those relationships where he, I came in and, and having – they always talk about the standpoint, not only have I played, but I've been coaching in this league for a long time. And all those years combined, that within itself, you're coming into the room as a guy in a lead position. So he's been good on the, from the standpoint of the dialogue between all the new guys, having the conversations back and forth. So he's been really good from that standpoint and understanding the nuances of how we do what we do on a daily. And that's been really huge. Paul, and then Dave Zingaro. 
Hey, Mark Juan. Uh, I believe your last year as a player was was Jim's first year as, a, as the head coach in Detroit. So we're talking 11 years there. How has his defense evolved in those 11 years? Uh, is it very much different than, than back then or or not? It has it has evolved. Uh, some of the things that, because at the time it was actually uh, Gunther Cunningham running it. Um, so some things have changed. Some things have evolved. Uh, some things have a few carryovers uh, between things that we did uh from a standpoint, schematically, they've changed. But for the most part, it's still aggressive. Uh, still starts up front, and we handle everything on the back end. Um, so from that standpoint, it was it was really refreshing to see the similarities, but also exciting to see the things that he has changed. Dave and then Jeff. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen Darius Slay play from afar for a long time. Now that you're coaching him, is he as good as advertised? I tell you this, man. It was it was actually even in the off season when we traded and we had the dialogue. We talked the ne- we talked that night and we talked the next morning. And what you guys don't know, and what I kind of figured out by talking to guys, but what you guys don't know is he's super urging to get knowledge. He doesn't think that I'm done at being becoming the best player I can possibly be. And for a coach, that's always encouraging. When you watch the things that we finally got an opportunity to get to the field that we seen on tape that you can see he matches a guy, he puts his hands on everybody, and he competes. But to watch it from also in the classroom, watch it when we do were doing it virtually, to now watching the nutrition and now on the field translating to the other guys, you know, being a leader. And that's that's like what's not talked about with him. A lot of people don't talk about that showing the young guys, working with the wide receivers at the practice, working on his craft. So, you know, playing with the guys like Champ and Woodson and those guys that I play with, and now watching a guy who's very elite at this position, he's on his way. So it's exciting, man. we got time for a couple more, so we'll go Jeff, Zach, and then Mike. Uh, in reference to Sidney Jones, you said earlier that you told him when you first spoke to him that there were three things you needed him to do. Could you be more specific about those three things? Well, one of the things in this league, man, you have to be accountable. That's one thing. You know, like I said, you know, he was upbeat and accountable. Understand that you have to compete daily. That's one of the things that we had to do. Be accountable, compete daily, be willing to learn. And if you consistently do those three things in this league, you can have success. Everyone's skill set is different. We all understand that. You guys understand that. I also understand that. However, how can you implement now what do you do great? We can't be great at everything, but we also can work at things that we know we can get better. So I practice it until I can't get it wrong. So his accountability and commitment and hard working is really what I asked him. And that was the challenge. And that's going to continue to be the challenge. I just wanted him to understand that confidence goes a long way in this league, man, on whatever you do. Go ahead, Zach, and then Mike. Hey, Mark, on what experience do you have with corners translating over safeties or, or moving over safety? And, and what made Jalen Mills the ideal type of player to do so? Um, you go back and you look at it, uh, it was a combination. Um, Ricardo Allen in Atlanta was the same. When I got there, he was a practice squad corner that never played safety. The good part about Jalen is he's not learning a new defense. And that's the easy part. When I say that, he sat in the same meeting room for over the last four and a half years and can regurgitate every adjustment that he's possibly heard prior. So with that being said, playing the position, me having played both, now it's just transitioning his, his eyes which at times in Jim's defense, he was in those positions, just not a 1,000% of the time. So the naked eye won't see it. Maybe a motion, maybe a shift, something that put him in that position. So now he's there full time. So it's been a pleasure, man, to watch this guy who's also played it in college. So that's another thing that it's not foreign to him. It's now just understanding, like you said, and he talks about this a lot, is getting the verbiage that now moving from the outside corner position, he may have had to say one thing 
or when he heard a certain term at from the safety, it now means something to him with the interior. So I, I wouldn't say that the, the 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 best benefit that he actually has was being here. So I think the sky's the limit. We're really excited about him, man, and his leadership. And you guys know this from watching him. He's the ultimate competitor. So that within itself, asking a guy with that skill set now to move in and cover tight ends, play it versus the run and things of that nature and be vocal in communication, he's already a natural-born leader from that standpoint. Last one, Mike. I've noticed the last two days you've been very vocal with Rasul Douglas back and forth. Uh, can you talk about that relationship and what do you like about his game uh, so far? You know what? Um, one of the things about Rasul is – he wants to know why. And, and as, a, as a player, you always want to know why. And as a coach, I always wanted to make sure that we have the why. But he is a good competitor. One of the things that we talked about, and almost the same that I said to Sid, and you guys are going to hear me say this a lot, what is your level of commitment? What does that mean? Being commitment and being diligent in what you're asked to do, down in and down out. We just don't make things up. So you have to make sure that you understand that I have to be diligent in what I do as far as what I play in technique, how hard I play, and that now I can go back and I can I can look at and evaluate myself, self-evaluation, on what I'm asked to do, and am I accomplishing that down in and down out? Consistency in technique, consistency in effort, that's what stands the test of time in this league. A ball is going to get caught on you. I haven't seen from Charles the champ, I haven't seen Sherm, I haven't seen a guy not get a ball caught on. But consistently, how can you go battle what techniques are you using? Can you now understand what do I need to apply, the application? So that's where you see the dialogue coming in, man. And you, you guys going to know I, I, the, the part about me that, that you guys don't know is that I love football. So it's, it's the dialogue consistently. It's always a conversation that's never ending.